Hey everyone, and welcome back to The Last Edit Podcast, a podcast on film starring yours truly, Silver Hawkins, and my great friend, Citizen Sleeve. Hello there. Uh, today's film is one that I picked, and it's, it, it is uh, the 2006 or seven, I think. I think it's two, from 2006. Um, film Das Leben der Anderen by um, or the lives of others in English uh, by it was the debut film of Florian Henkel von Donnersmark uh, it won the Academy of Award for best foreign language film beat out uh, another stellar film by Guillermo del Toro uh, Pan's Labyrinth and it stars uh, Ulrich Mühe as um, a Stasi agent named Gerd Wiesler basically the film opens in I think it's 1984 prior to like the early to mid 80s prior to um gorbachev's election as uh, secretary general for the soviet communist party and his implementation of reforms glasnost and perestroika and um it basically tells the story of uh, Wiesla, the sta- dedicated stasi agent completely loyal to the system uh he sees uh Dreiman, um a playwright put on a play and he immediately becomes suspicious of him that because um, his uh, close friend and superior Grubitsch tells him, no, no, Diamond's above suspicion. He's basically, he's the perfect, perfect artist for us because he keeps, they even read him in the West. He never um, expresses disloyalty or anything. And for Wiesla, you know, um, that immediately sets off an alarm bell that he's too perfect. There has to be something there. And as luck would have it, the culture minister for, uh, East Germany, Bruno Hempf, uh, is um, is uh, interested in uh, Diamond's uh, lover, Christa Maria Sieland, and uh, starts to express to Gubitz an interest that he wants Diamond to be surveyed so that they can dig up some dirt on him and basically get him out of the way. And that basically means that Vista starts uh, a massive surveillance program of, of Diamond. And uh, as the surveillance program then progresses, Wiesler starts to have second thoughts, which is basically the plot of the film. Um, It's a film that has a huge soft spot in my heart. Um, It's one of the rare films where there isn't really any element of it that I would change. Um, But yeah, uh, I'm really interested to hear what your impressions were of it. Well, I actually thought I'd seen it before, but I hadn't. Um, I, I know when it came out, I remember the buzz around it but it's just one that maybe slipped through my net. So it was really interesting um, watching it in 2019. Now, I'm a child of the 80s, so I was born in 79, I grew up in the 80s, so I remember seeing the Berlin Wall um, come down. So that era of German politics, I I have somewhat of a knowledge of. So it'll be interesting when we we get to the end and talk about that phase. But I I think it's one of the most well-constructed films I've ever seen. Um, First of all, um, Wiesler... Is such an amazing character. He starts off as this straight button down the line, um, very obedient, um, very. He, he wants to please his superiors, but really it's all about party the soldier, truth for yeah. him. Yeah, it's it's about the party, not not the people in the party. It's about being true to the party, the Stasi. And he's very stoic. He's very. It, he seems very cold and very unloving. And through the course of the film, we see that completely shift and change in a number of ways. I, I particularly like the duality between his actions on screen and the actions of Dreiman and the way they they almost sync up without Dreiman even knowing it. And um, we'll come to that in a bit though. I just there's a couple of moments that I really like about that. It was really interesting to me. In particular, this Grubitz. He's almost like this hapless hapless odd character who doesn't really quite understand Wiesler's talent for for delving into these these you know really quite nasty situations and extracting information to to um to charge someone and yet he uses his own advice to convince Hempf that you know he he should do that that's how he answers he takes his answer and uses it as, as his own yeah. and later as we as, as Grubitz develops as a character he he becomes nastier and nastier, really. Yeah, I mean, you know, my really... my my reading of Gorbitz is that he's the political animal. Yeah. He's the one who adapt. He he he's the survivor, as where he adapts himself mm. to whatever the situation requires of him. 
So when he well, meets he wants with him, advancement, hemp, doesn't he? Yes, absolutely. Hmm. That that's basically all it is is advancement and survival. So when he meet, meets with Hemp, he basically quickly had, after he had just um, Vizsla had told him he wanted to survey Dryman, and v- hmm. Kubitz dismisses him and says, "No, no, no, he's he's loyal and whatnot. You're you're crazy. You're seeing, you're being too paranoid." And then he goes to Hemp, and Hemp says, "What do you think of Dryman?" And then uh, Kubitz immediately catches on what Hemp actually wants. And he starts uh, selling him Wiesler's narrative that no, they're, he's a little too perfect. There has to be some dirt there. And then uh, Hemp obviously applauds him. And uh, and they sort of um, form a mutual alliance of convenience. Um, yeah, and, uh, and and when the kind of investigation starts, so so Wiesler sets up along with this other guy called, is it Bud, I think? The, the younger guy who's been drafted in, who's quite funny at times. And yeah, I think like Budo or, or something. Budo, or something like that. And he and, and they basically uh, are building next door, I think, aren't they? And, uh, uh, on the attic. Or near. The attic, yeah. I think. Uh, so they they go in, they they wire up um, Dreamin's In an place. amazing scene. Oh, yeah, the, the way that they um, just insert all these instruments to be able to... to yeah, and they run it by clockwork, like, oh, we have exactly 20 minutes... Then we have yeah, the light switches, yeah. you know, behind walls, in between different parts of the of the uh, flat, which is really really cool. The way that it's shot and the way it's um, yeah, just the spycraft of it. Yeah, yeah, very really cool. And then they start the actual spying. And to begin with, Visla is uh, as we mentioned straight down the line. He's there to do his job to find I mean, out the truth. That that that's some um, sort of emphasized by when when they install all this equipment in Diamond's um, apartment to survey him. Uh, his neighbor actually sees them through. Um, yes. Yeah. Through her peephole in the door, um, and Vizsla notices her and immediately comes up and he just, uh, like as as naturally as as if he was just saying hi, do you have some eggs or something? He just says, you know, uh, it your sh- it would be a shame if uh, your son never actually completed his uh, doctor uh, mm-hmm. study at, at school. Um, so you never saw anything, right? And yeah, yeah, I never saw anything. Obviously, just intimidating her into compliance. Um, yeah, and then he's like afterwards to to one of the crew. He's like, and send her a gift for being loyal or something. You know? Yeah, because <laughs> that's what you do to to sweeten these people. And there's there's a scene later on actually where um, Thryman wants his tie tied because he can't do it himself. He's had this gift uh, gift from Krista because it's his birthday, and he asks um, this neighbor to come in and tie yeah, the tie from, for him. From yeah. From and and he she goes in she does it and she she obviously knows what's happening but can't say anything and doesn't say a word just turns around straight out again yeah because you she's see su- how un- I mean she's super nervous because she knows the yeah. apart- apartment is under surveillance and if she says yeah, anything exactly. they'll immediately pick up on it yeah yeah it's a very weird situation isn't it and yeah. and then the, the counterpoint later on is is in the lift but we'll we'll get to that bit so initially Vaisla sets up and he's he's doing shifts with them bird and they are. They're sharing these these kind of stretches of time where they're listening into everything Dryman and Krista are saying, and it's really interesting to begin with because he's he's literally writing down what they are doing. There's there's you know he wants to support the stars. He wants to make sure that he's doing the the proper job that needs to be done in this kind of situation, and slowly but surely, that kind of unravels. But it takes a little while for that character to change, and it takes a few moments for that character to change. Even things that, that aren't directly related to that, like when he's sat in the cafeteria with Rubitz, and yeah. a young uh, Stasi officer is making a joke about Hemph. No, about A. Uh, oh, uh, oh, the okay. Prime Minister of. Uh, oh, Prime Minister, sorry. And, uh, and, and Rubitz. Oh man, he, he just he winds this kid up by saying, "Hey, you're you're never gonna work again," blah blah blah, and then he rewinds him up by telling his own joke about him. But then this kid ends up disappearing anyway. You know, we'll, and we'll talk about that as well. It, there's so much subtlety in this film to each of the performances, and in that particular scene, Visla he he looks kind of bemused. He doesn't quite understand the, the political animal that Grubitz is, and doesn't really quite understand. I think what he's doing with this kid and these little doubts start to creep in that grow and grow and grow but i think i think the one that really kind of kicks it kicks everything in properly like before he's, he's kind of playing about he's he's lying a little bit here and there but but initially it's fine with bud and he's reading his transcript and all that kind of stuff but as he starts to realize 
what's actually happening and the hemp and Krista situation. Yeah. There's, there's that one moment which I, I thought was amazing. Weisler's um, listening and he notices one of the cameras that's out looking from the flat that Krista is stepping out of of hemp's car. Well, it, it's worth noting that he's 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 noticed the limo before. Um, Krista mm. has been dropped off by the limo before, but when he went to Grubitz to say, hey, there's a limo dropping Krista off, what, what is this limo, and so forth, because I mean, mm. it's East Germany, not everyone has access to a limo. Mm, um, absolutely. And Grubitz tells him, oh, that's actually Minister Hemp's car. That's Minister Hemp dropping her off. So, um, and I mean, these are delicate matters, Wiesla. We can't include this in the report. We have to omit mm. this. Um, and that's when Wiesla realizes that he's not actually doing the surveillance for security reasons. He's yeah. not doing it for the state. He's doing it for Hemp, so that Hemp can get his hands on Christa Maria and basically get Dreiman out of the way. And he keeps saying to him as well, um, and Grubitz, he keeps repeating to Weisler all the time, you've got to get this right, because if you don't get it right, I'm screwed and you're screwed. Won't be advancement for either of us, and yeah. that's what we want. That's the important thing. But it's not to Weisler. And that's no. not what he's doing yeah. his job for. He's doing it for but, the party. Exactly. But this one moment, he, he's, he sees um, on the camera the car pull up, Chris to get out uh, and walk to the flat or get, you know, motion toward moving to the flat. And what is it he says? It's about time you knew the truth? Something like that? Yeah, something, and, something to that effect, yeah. And he, I thought it was a, just brilliant. Because they've got the house rigged up, he basically calls the landline in Dryman's flat and gets him, to, or the doorbell, and yeah. gets him to get up and go to the door and open it because it's so persistently it's, ringing. It's also, I mean, this is also paid off by, it's um, it's laid up early in the film by the fact that their neighbor, Frau Meinecke, has a tendency to lock the front door, so it's not uncommon mm. for people to ring their doorbell. So it's not like out of the ordinary for him to have to go down there and, and open it up. Yeah, yeah. So he goes to the door, Dryman, he opens it, and he he, see, he knows immediately whose car it is, and, and, and he sees Krista. And he just closes the door, and he steps to the side in the shadow and just watches her open the door and come in. She gets immediate in the shower to, to cl cleanse herself of this horrible, horrible act. Yeah, because... Hemp is a disturbing in, individual. I mean, be, before then, in we actually get a scene in the limo of Krista with with Hemp. He picks her up, she, she leaves a couple of friends at... I'm not sure where they were, a cafe or something, a bookstore. Yeah, out in the street, um, there's two of the friends. Yeah. yeah, and she goes, and she leaves, says goodbye to them, and then she walks down the street, and Hemp pulls up in the limo and orders Krista to get into the car. Because Hemp is the cultural minister. Krista Maria Zeland is an actress. She acts yeah. in Diamond's Place and so forth, another place, and um, and Hemp wields all the power. He's basically, he can say, he can blacklist her so that she never, ever works again. Uh, there's another writer, uh, there's another a theater director who's a very close friend with the uh, Dreiman, Robert Jaska, who's been blacklisted by the party so that he can't ever work again. He's basically unemployed. He's a director with, without the ability to direct, uh, as he says. Yeah, um, he's the symbol of what happens if you mess with the stars, if you mess with the party. Yes, and, and, he, and he's also his basically... His decline... And he's what well, turns his decline Dreiman. is like Dreiman's. Because you're right, yeah. you touched on... There's a duality there between um, Dreiman and Wiesler, because Dreiman actually starts out as a loyalist to the system as well. Mm. Like, he calls out his um, some of his friends who are critics of the system and criticizes them. No, 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 the system's good and so forth. No, we ha we just have to sort of improve upon it a little bit. Um, and it's only the story of Jaska as it progresses in the film that basically turns Dreiman into a critic of the system. And turns him against the system, and yeah, and and, and, and with him, Jess Beastlet sort of turns as well. Yeah, yeah, and, and Jessica's whole part in this film. I mean, not only is it is, is it this decline which kicks Thurman's kind of mindset into, into 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 overdrive and what he needs to do, what he should do in this type of situation, but the decline of this playwright and his eventual suicide. I mean, it's such a sad story. This this once yeah. um, really prominent director. Um, uh, hasn't made anything important in the last ten years because he's yeah. blacklisted. Um, Hemp dangles the um, the carrot of oh maybe you won't be, and he's clearly lying to, dr to drive him straight away. Yeah, I mean there, he's, uh, he, he says there's always hope until we die. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, that's a mantra we should all live by. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then he goes to you know he goes to visit him, Dryman, and he sees how how kind of unhappy 
um, and, and just beaten down um, Albert is. Yeah. And, and, and then we have that moment in the party where Albert's sent everybody away and he's just sat reading a book. By himself, yeah. By himself, at uh, uh, Dry- Dryman's own 40th. And he just hands him a present. And then that's the last time he sees him because later on then we hear that he, the, he's um, hung himself, Jessica's yeah. commit- has hung himself, committed suicide. And that's just... Uh, you know, that's a symbol of what happens when you take away someone's creativity and their art, if they're an artist. Yeah, you kill you know, their soul, basically. I mean, there's another exactly. scene later on when um, when Wiesler actually has evidence on Dreimann, and he intends to turn him in. And he shows up at Kubitz, Kubitz's office, and then Kubitz is there, and he's basically worked on a new a thesis with a student who's under him, because he mm-hmm. serves as a professor at sort of the Stasi uh, education headquarters. Um, and uh, someone under him has made a thesis on sort of um, the different type of I- of artists in society and how you can neutralize them. And he yeah, basically like goes five through five different types or something. Yeah. yeah. And he basically goes through the exact type that Diamond is. And this is, and all we have to do is basically just put him in solitary for like six months or something. Then we release him without anything, any no further recourse or anything. We just re- put him out there. And while he's in solitary, we give him food. We don't abuse him in any way. We treat him right. He's just in solitary, and mm. then we just let him out, and then he'll never produce anything again. Yeah, like he'll never been criticize nullified. anything. Yeah, he's just yeah, been neutralized. Exactly. And, it's and ridiculous, isn't it? And he's and Kubitz is sitting there like immensely proud of this, and Wiesler's just sitting there with the envelope that he knows is going to turn Diamond over to this, yeah. and then he can't go through with it, and he goes yeah. back out. It's it's just I mean to even even think about being proud of essentially a torture technique to eradicate someone's um, mentality and their creativity yeah. is like oh wow man but that that was exactly the period of time in Germany that, that this kind of stuff was going on um, and then it's a totalitarian system really y- yeah yeah absolutely and, and uh, yeah just it's it's such a it's such an intricate film in terms of the relationship between each of these kind of five or six main characters. Uh, I, I really, really like... There, there are really nice moments in it as well. There's a moment when um, Weissler is... There's non-diegetic classical music playing in the background. And Weissler is just doing what he's been doing, which is listening to, to Diamond and, and um, Krista. And Diamond starts playing a really kind of beautiful but this, melancholy this is, piano. This is the song. moment when Diamond gets the phone call that Jaska has just hung himself. So he yeah. takes up this present, which was basically a piano sonata that... Um, that Jaska had, gift, had gifted him, uh, called Sonata for the Good Man. And then uh, mm-hmm. he finally sets it on the on his piano and starts actually playing it. And then, yeah, Misla hears it. And starts crying as well. You know, the, the, I've, I've, there's very few moments in the first half of the film, really, when Misla shows any form of emotion. Yeah. Anything at all. And then all of a sudden in this scene, not, uh, not only the music and the situation, but something in him as well, just just wants to be emotional, wants to sh- shed some emotion for what's happening, for what's happened to this guy, for what's happening in his country, all these different... For what he thought he was actually fighting for in the Stasi, when really he's not fighting for what he maybe thought he was now. Yeah. Because things and, have changed. And it's punctuated after he completes the piece. Um, Diamond turns to uh, Christa Maria and asks, can anyone who's really heard this music, really listened to it, actually be a good bad person yeah like really heard it and connected with it yeah and understand um, what it actually means yeah there's some there's some really really beautiful moments um in, in this film and i think that that encapsulates a, a good uh, core of the themes that this director is trying to to convey to people yeah you know, the think, beauty of art the beauty to, of music to me i mean the most like emotionally resonant moment to me is probably we touched on the scene in the car in the limo between Hempf and, and Christa Maria, which is one of the most uncomfortable rape scenes I've ever seen, where he yeah. gets her into the limo and then he starts basically kissing and groping her and mm. and eventually having intercourse with her in the limo. And she can't really resist because if she resists, she'll get blacklisted and she'll never work again like Jaska. Uh, and of course, that's a dyna- dynamic we've seen play all too often in, in real life, unfortunately. Mm. Um, and yeah, and she, as she comes home, the first thing... It, Immediately she does is run upstairs and go into the shower and she just collapses and cries in the shower. And then she goes into bed and Simon sits and he doesn't know what to do. He knows what just happened and he's completely powerless to do anything. He can't really help her hmm. and he's completely powerless and she's just lying there in bed and then she says, 
I need you to hold me. And he just goes into bed and just holds her. And they just lie there in silence. Um, which is really emotionally resonant, I felt. And uh, Yo, just um, no, really definitely. well done. You don't always need dialogue, uh, dialogue heavy, you know, um, pieces to be able to to emote effectively, and that's what this scene does wonderfully well. I think that uh, there are there are little turning points throughout the film, but I think that moment in particular for Dryman uh, and and not being able to really convince Krista to begin with to not go back to to get away from the situation yeah. that he's enough. I think that's the, the real pivot in the narrative. Because that's at the point where Dryman changes. We've already seen, yeah. uh, we've already seen other characters change. Um, but that that's and the Gaspar Steph, yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. And Visla, you know, we've already seen starting to change. But I think that's the moment when he then decides, I need, to, I, I need to write some propaganda here. In essence, I need to tell the truth. I need it to to go beyond these walls to the other side of Germany, where it'll be taken seriously, and people will understand what's happening over here. Yeah. Understand what's happening in the divide in this country. So he then, very slyly, as best as he can, hooks up with two of his friends um, who are also uh, playwrights, etc. And system critics. And, yeah. and critics, yeah. And that's when everything becomes really interesting. Because, the, first of all, they meet outside because they don't believe that um, anywhere is going to be safe internally because it's going to be wired, someone's going to be watching them. So they decide they're going to do this. They decide they're going to... Um, what I should know this. Die, die Spiegel... I should know that anyway. The newspaper that, that eventually Der prints yeah. Der Spiegel, and yeah, they concoct this plan and they decide they're going to go back to to, to Dryman's place and they're going to basically create this little situation that will prove whether or not the flat is bugged in essence. And it doesn't work out, but it does work out, which is crazy. Yeah. So, so they send this guy to the border. Um, one of Hauser, one of his one of his friends, another yeah, writer, one of his the uh, uncle, I think, of one of the uh, sisters. Yeah critics yeah and they they have a few beers and stuff but they've already set this thing up where they do something they go to the border they um illegally try and get this guy through in, a, in his boot and if the border patrol finds him then it's proof they're being listened in on and they are indeed being bugged and someone's in the background they can't go there and speak about what they want to do yeah i mean but, they don't actually transport something someone they say they yeah, they're, they're they going say to. they will yeah yeah and then visla is like, oh, uh, okay, right, uh, okay, let's not report that, which bamboozles them, because they're like, okay, the flat's fine then. So they start opening up and talking about their plans. And as this starts to happen, he's, he's given a, a very small... Oh, I should just mention that in, in this film, because of the, the period, um, the font style, the typeface of a typewriter is unique to the individual to some extent and they are all recorded so imagine your yeah. ip address now your ip address tells people where you are what you're watching what you're doing all that kind of stuff. So, so you can be spied on you know in in the modern era but back then it was all about typeface so they get this illegal typewriter which isn't registered with a red typeface which is not known and um they start typing this not manifesto but this um blunt outline of the truth to send away of what of what suicide that uh, about the fact that suicide about rates suicides, are not yeah. monitored in in eastern in east germany um that they yeah. stopped recording suicides yeah and all these other stats that they do record which yeah. are far less important and so the three of them keep meeting um Dryman hides the typewriter in between his, his lounge in another room under a floorboard uh, which will come in is important later on but in the background, Wiesler has already decided in his mind that he's going to protect these people. Yeah. So first, of, the first thing he does is get Bud off the case. It's a little bit of a hard sell to Grubitz, and he's a little bit concerned Grubitz. Yeah, he smells like, okay. that something's up, that he's not yeah. getting the whole truth. Yeah, exactly. But he still kind of trusts the guy, so he could let, let it play out a little bit. So it's just Wiesler now doing the, the, the recording, the listening in. And he starts writing down the play that they're writing. Yeah, they're I mean, they, 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 they jokingly say, what are we going to say Why are, is the reason for the fact that we're meeting? Oh, we're going to say we're working on a play celebrating the 40th anniversary of the East German Republic. Yeah, And then Wiesler actually starts making up the play. Yeah. <laughs> and writing amazing. the play, yeah. Yeah, and, and so this, this, this happens As throughout. As a cover story, this. yeah. 
and it's a wonderful cover story. So this keeps this keeps happening for a while, and the situations become more and more intense. And after a while, it's done, and it's sent to the Spiegel, and it's on TV, and they're watching it. What Dreamin doesn't know at this point is that Krista has kind of been turned by now. So unfortunately, she's a little bit later on. She's still Hemp is still after her. She ends up. Um, yeah, I mean, Hemp, be, there, there's a scene. He, she does actually stop seeing Hemp. Uh, yeah, eventually yeah, for a period, and yeah. she comes back to to Dreiman, Um and we see a scene where Hemp is left waiting for her, pathetically, by himself mm-hmm. in the in the hotel room where he was supposed to meet her. Uh, and obviously, Hemp is pretty pissed off by the fact mm-hmm. that that Krista has now um, rejected him. So uh, the consequences are, unfortunately, he knows that she has a drug abuse problem uh, mm. with Pitt, that she takes pills. Uh, and that becomes sort of the uh, excuse for the Stasi to snatch her up. And, mm. uh, and that's their way in. Yeah, and put her in the interview chamber with, with Kubitz. I suppose we should, we should mention just before um, um, that happens, there's that really interesting scene in the cafe uh, Wiesler's in there because that's, that's the moment that gets her back to Dreiman yeah I mean yeah. You, you said Dreiman fails to convince her not to go to uh, to Hemp they have a pretty big sort of, kind of argument about it yeah and she goes anyway and uh, Wiesler's sort of he's really caught up in, 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 in the middle of the argument when um, yeah when his other guy comes in on on time for once because throughout the film he's always been like five three or five minutes late which is mm. really annoyed Wiesler and this one time in the middle of the argument where Wiesler's really caught up he finally he's finally on time and Wiesler has to hand him over the uh, the headphones yeah and he's to like <laughs> yeah wait <laughs> really slowly yeah wait, wait no what are they talking about and oh she's just going to see a family friend yeah yeah and yeah, uh, just and that yeah, whole and so he go great. he goes to the bar. He's really sort of distraught by what he heard and the fact mm. that that Krista is still going to see him. That Dreiman could not convince her not to go. And then as he sits down, has a few vodkas. Krista actually turns up at the bar and she sits down and she's com- immensely conflicted about the fact whether she should go see him or stay with Dreiman. Mm. And Wiesler then goes and has a conversation with her and says no. You should you should stay with Dreiman. You don't need him. Um, yeah, your your audience loves you. you yeah, you're, you're a not true who, artist. You're you're not who you are now. You're who you are when you're on stage, and all these things that really kind of amp her own personality and lack of confidence, at least up for for a while. And we have that period where she doesn't seem, but then things don't go so well after that. No, because unfortunately, unfortunately it has consequences that she doesn't see him, which are yeah. the consequences that she feared that the blacklisting gets held over her and she she sort of informs on Dreiman but she doesn't entirely she she knows where his hiding place for the typewriter is but she doesn't give mm-hmm. them that so so yeah she informs on him in that way and they search his search his apartment they they don't find the typewriter so it seems like it was a false report mm. uh but then unfortunately um Kubitz pulls in Wiesla and Wiesla manages to then get the full confession from uh, from Krista. Uh, but in his own way. Yeah. And she obviously clocks that it's him that she's met before. So they go through this weird interrogation. Wiesla's very calm. He knows exactly what he's doing yeah. in that situation. And yeah, he manages to convince her to tell him. <coughs> but then also he very slyly manages to get to the flat before the next um, check, as it were. Yes, before co- before they can actually writer. search it, yeah. Yeah. And then hide the typewriter. Yeah. And then it really goes badly. Yeah, because, I mean, um, there's a moment where, I mean, they they, search, they, they come and search um, Diamond's apartment for the second time. And this time, Kubitz himself is sort of leading the search. And he's saying, oh, we just want to make sure it's done correctly. And then he just sort of, sort, kind of randomly, with really poor acting, he goes to these other places. Oh, nothing here, nothing here. And then he goes to, like, the doorway with the uh, doorstep, the fake doorstep. And he goes, oh, what have we here? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and at that point, at that moment, Diamond knows instantly that Krista has, has informed on him. And they yeah. lock eyes. And that just completely withers Krista's soul. Completely. It destroys her. The fact that she's sort of betrayed her and that that look that they share 
and she just runs out and she basically commits suicide by running in front of a van and yeah. letting it run her over. And that's one of the saddest moments in the film because, you know, she she's trying to be an artist. She's trying to serve um, her But she's just crushed by the system, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this, this system breaks her, you know, and... and she wants to protect him and she loves him. She, she's, you know, he, he's the love of her life. But in that instant, she feels so guilty, so overcome by what she's done. She, she feels like she, she has to end it. So she, yeah, she wants to straight get hit by a van. Um, Wiesler is actually there first. And yeah, and, and she sort of, himself. And she sort of cries. Um, There's no forgiveness for what I've done. Uh, like I can never be forgiven. Um, and then she sort of die and then Diamond comes over and she dies in his arms dies in Diamond's arms yeah and then and that scene always cuts me emotionally oh, like oh dies, yeah because it's, it's, it tears it, me apart it, it, I mean there are, you know, there's so many moments in this narrative when the narrative pivots and, and that's the next time when it pivots because at that point Grubitz basically so the investigation is called off because of Krista's death and Grubitz just outside of, of, of the building they work in um, what Visa's in his car just says to him I know that or something like this I know there's no evidence and I know that uh, you've been very clever about all this and I think that you've engineered this situation and you'll never work here again you'll work in Department M which is basically licking envelopes and in the basement and, of the Stasi headquarters yeah right? and, and, de and delivering post and stuff like that they, they have to sort of steam open letters so that they're yeah. ready to, to be read by someone <laughs> and and this is where things change. So, th this whole ends. And he says, "Oh, and you'll be doing it for twenty years." Twenty years, like, yeah. For twenty years until the end of your career. There'll be no advancement. This, and then, and then, then, as he says that, there, there's a camera pan to um, the newspaper on uh, the yeah. seat next to Vizla, which says the Gorbachev has just been elected president, uh, yeah. general secretary of the Soviet Union's Communist Party. Yeah. The whole end, se end sequence is beautifully constructed beautifully so we get this shot uh, mid close up of Wiesler licking these envelopes tediously but he doesn't lick, him, he doesn't lick them he steams them open oh there's, steams them open. there's this uh, sort of and all, all of these it has to be said all of the equipment in the film including the steam opener and the microphones and whatnot are all authentic Stasi equipment lent to the film by by museums that's really cool that's yeah. very very cool um and just behind him is the kid who was sat at a table who got derided by Grubitz. Um, and he leans over forward and just says, the walls come down. The walls come down. And they, the whole room, but especially Visa, just sit there for a minute contemplating this thing they maybe thought would never happen. And obviously it's because of Gorbachev, yeah. because of the changes in, in German um, political system. And he just stands up. He walks out. And everyone and else follows you. Everyone else follows, yeah. Now, after that, we we see um, Visla working and walking through the streets and this kind of stuff. But in between, we see Dreamen finally being given the opportunity to see all of the notes that were made by Visla while he yeah, was being. I mean, watched. before then, it's worth noting that he he is um, that af after the war the the fall of the wall scene, he cuts to Dreamen sitting at a. Um, at one of his plays, the same play that he uh, puts on at the start of the mm, film, he walks out. Yeah. It's now sort of put on in a slightly altered state in the new Germany, and um, when when the scene comes with the actress has her big scene, and it used to be in the part that used to be Christa Maria Sielans, sort of Dreimann can't take it, and he has to leave, and he goes out to sort of get a breather, and the, out there he actually meets um, Minister Hempf. Yeah. Uh, who's, who's, who says to him, yeah, I couldn't take it either, the, um, the memory of, of Krista. Uh, and then uh, he tells Dreimann that he was under full surveillance because Dreimann asks him, why, wasn't, why, why was I never surveyed back then? Oh, you were under full surveillance. And then sort of to twist the knife in a little further because he just can't help himself, he, Hemp goes, um, so we knew everything about you. We even knew that you could never sat satisfy our, our little Krista. And then Dreimann just basically looks at him and says, um, to think people like you used to run my country. Yeah. And then he turns around and leaves. And um, just leaves. 
It's a truly despicable I, character. Has. Absolutely, and I, I mean, I really appreciate the fact that he never gets his comeuppance because she, <laughs> traditionally That's you life. see that. But yeah, yeah, unfortunately, it's it's, yeah. it's it's a reflection of reality, you know. Yeah, Hollywood has a very nice way of wrapping things up, and that's what Hollywood does for the most part. Um, these type of films don't do that. They 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 show you the short, stark reality of the the horrible situations that these people have to go through, and the fact that a lot of these truly heinous individuals in these situations go got free they they survive. Yeah, everything's fine for them so so yeah so this gives dreamer the setup to go and finally look at these notes which are now available because the walls come down and what he finds is books and books and books that start with yeah it's, exactly it's, what they it's were pretty doing. funny the moment because he, he expects he sees everyone else sitting there with like one or two files yeah and he's just in this yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like stacked up three layers yeah. or and, and like we have another couple each. of pad we have another couple of piles down in the basement or something yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the the way his face and emotion changes as he reads through all of them you know, yeah he starts off with the literal things that have been happening and then he starts realizing that he's been protected by Visla. Everything, yeah. everything that's happened, all all the stuff um, that he was writing, everything he was trying to achieve has all been protected from Stasi by this Stasi officer. And then he start, he, he gets to the end and he's like, "Wow, I need to find out who this person is." And it's just got initials. So he asks the person at the front of the room. He gets a name. And what I found really interesting about just this little bit is. He drives, he gets a taxi, he drives um, to the route in which uh, Wiesler is kind of delivering stuff. He doesn't get out, he just watches him for a minute to know who the but man he, is. He does get out, but he stops himself. But yeah, yeah, so, yeah he, doesn't, he doesn't interact with him, he yeah. doesn't talk to him, he doesn't go over to him. He just kind of, look, you know, is an onlooker. To, to, just, to, he wants to see this person, this individual that helped, um, helped him so much. How can and I best? Then, I think I think at that moment he's sort of thinking, how can I best repay him? How can I best sort of mm. express my gratitude to him? And, on a, and on it's a not scale really by a personal know. meeting; it's by what he then yeah. does next. Yeah, which is the song that was played before, um, which is now a play, and or a novel, a novel. And the the moment that Visla realizes is. It's one of the best moments in the film. I mean, he go he passes by the bookstore and it says like Gaiman yeah. finally back with a new book, uh, Sonata for a Good Man, and then he goes in and he sees the book and he sees um he flips in a couple of pages and there, one of the first pages is dedicated to um his initials. Yeah. In gratitude. Yeah. And then um the store clerk goes, oh, do you want me to gift wrap it? And uh, and Vista says, no, it's for me. And that mm. that I mean that closing line is. I think the yeah. best closing line I've ever seen in a film. It's it's a line with amazing gravitas, and it's a line that is, you know, Dryman will never hear it, um, no one else will know it, but he knows that that this this piece of art, this thing that reflects everything he's tried to to protect, is is for him, and that's yes. something wonderful to to give to another human being. Especially because been so much. especially because Beastler has never been given anything. He's always yeah. been. Sort of the cock, the automaton, um, like as as you said in in the start, he's this emotionless cock soldier in the system, completely loyal. And there's scene after I think it's after um Krista returns to Diamond after she was supposed to go yeah. to Hemp. Yeah, I know what you mean. Where he go, where they have very passionate sex, and then he goes home and he tries to sort of or, or make no no I think it's after I think it's actually after um. After the rape scene, where where they um cuddle up on bed together, where he goes and he he wants some share share of the some some amount of the intimacy that mm. that Krista and and Diamond share, and he uh, hires a prostitute, mm. and a very there's, there's a very mechanical sex scene, and afterwards he yeah, sort of begs awkward. he very, sort of begs the prostitute to stay with him, but no, she can't she can't she's. She's on a schedule. If you want more time, yeah. you're gonna have to schedule got, more time. Let's go have a client, yeah. and uh, but it's weird because it doesn't. It never comes across as as proper jealousy. It's just that he, he vicariously wants to try, kind of live part of his life through these people, and he needs to have some attachment to to, yeah. to that to that intimacy, to that warmth. There, but it doesn't a, work out that way. There's a scene where he breaks into their apartment, and he goes through some of their stuff, and he stops by the bed, and he just sort of runs his hand hmm. over the edge of it. 
and then he goes and steals the poetry book that uh, that Jaska left with um, with Dreiman. And he sits, and that's another scene where he sort of turns, where he, he reads all the, he reads this German poetry by Brecht, um, which also sort of instills that art, art, art um, sensibility in him. Hmm. I want to talk about the shot selection and the cinematography for a minute because we talked a lot about narrative and thematics and stuff like that, but the the way the camera captures the scenes is quite fantastic. Yeah. There are some marvellous sweeping pans across, you know, close up in rooms and tracking shots. And the composition of those shots is often perfect. Yeah. I mean, there's, as, a, as, a, as a, you know, I mean, not, I, I, don't think that, I don't think there's a better example of the, fa- of the scene where when they install all the bucking equipment in Diamond's apartment. Mm. Yeah. Just shot for shot, how that whole scene is sort of put together, edited and, and shot. It's just masterful. The blocking for that must have been insane to get right. They must have yeah. rehearsed that so, so much. It reminds me of, like, you know, the Goodfellas um, restaurant scene. You know, he walks in yes. all through the kitchen, round tables down, maybe not quite as elaborate, but the amount of different things going on and having to capture that in some organised structure. Wow, man. Such an amazing uh, um, sequence. The music as well. Yeah. It's 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 beautiful. It's, it's melancholy. It's... Um, aching at times yeah depending on the on, on the situation and the character and as i mentioned that that one piece of music um the, the main theme that is then played along with in terms of the piano so the diegetic meets the non-diegetic that that's a very good director <laughs> you know when you when you yeah. when you sew up those little moments that really is one especially for a debut like oh feature, yeah and, feature uh, film uh, debut. yeah and you, and you said to me um well, a few days ago that that's his best film, and since then he hasn't yeah. quite found um, um, a way to live up to that to that initial film, which is a shame because you can see his talent. Yeah, but I mean, it is left to live up to. That I mean, that's the problem when you sort of hit a home run on your first pitch, right? <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I think this film will will touch a lot of people, um, especially those maybe of a certain age who really understand what was going on. In East and West Germany at the time, the division yeah, and, between and the countries. totalitarian. I mean, it doesn't just apply to East Germany; it applies to pretty no, much any totalitarian state. I mean, <laughs> the, the 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 East German totalitarian state was sort of especially um, cruel in that it in how much it relied on informing and paid informants like Ulrich Mühe, the actor who plays Wiesla, was actually an actor in East Germany and he found he was a person of interest to the Stasi and he actually learned after they opened their archives after the wall fell he found uh, a file on his um, ex-wife that she had actually been an informant on him and that was common I mean uh, brothers sisters uh, husbands wives everyone basically informed on everyone that was the whole that was how the whole Stasi system was built up and I think the the film really does a really good job of this um, in in how it handles Christa's character in how she's pushed into informing on Diamond and basically destroys herself over it. Yeah, no, no choice. If, you know, the state yeah. is forcing you to do something and if you go against it, then, well, you're going to end up blacklisted in prison or dead. Yeah. That's, you know, uh, total- totalitarian is, you know, in it, its absolute purest form. Yeah. And... That that dichotomy between state control and the beauty of art and creativity. You know, that that's what this film is all about. How they yeah. rub against each Precisely. other. They can't survive I mean, in the same world. I mean, the most chilling, we talked about it, but the most chilling scene for me in the film is the one where Gulbitz lays out to Wiesler, how do you destroy an artist? How do you make sure that he never creates again? Right. Yeah, and, and that thought process. Yeah. To actually, you know, have defined that thought process in some kind of ideology that you then have tests and results from is the true, true meaning of um of parts of war. That's 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 what you do. Yeah. You you make the downtrodden feel worthless, and then they can't fight and get out of that situation, and then or you turn them on each other. To. Yeah, uh, which is exactly what this film is about. You yeah. Know? Those elements of mistrust. But it's it's interesting that Dreamman st- he still loves her and he st- he understands why she's done it. Yeah, he really does. He doesn't he doesn't want to believe that she will, 
and doesn't wouldn't like her to. He wants to think that she she doesn't have to do these things to to be the actress that she wants to be and is. But unfortunately, that's the no. The reality is unfortunately different because yeah. Hep has too much power yeah. as as the minister of culture. Yeah, absolutely. Well, as I said to you last night, I've only watched it once now, but it's forced my its way into my top fifty. And yeah, I am very protective of my top lists of films. <laughs> I have been for a very long time, so to force itself in there, it, it, it's a film that's going to need frequent rewatch, not frequent, but infrequent rewatchings to scrape away the layers of things that I certainly have missed. Um, again, I'm only slightly au fait with the, the the situation politically at the time. And and the, the the things that were happening in the background beyond what we saw in the news that was up front. So yeah. going back, I think there's so many layers to this film. It's going to be one that people are going to want to watch. Um, you're not going to understand everything straight away. You're not going to get every meaning straight away. But I think you'll come out of this film kind of thinking. You might be a bit melancholy, but I think that end will really kind of warm your heart. Yeah. I, I totally agree. Um, there's also there's a film from the same period that's kind of similar, not really in tone, but in subject matter, a comedy called Goodbye Lenin. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with it. Don't think so. Um, it's basically about uh, a kid. I think it's his mother who who's in a coma. He's, she's been in a coma since uh, East Germany. So she does. She wakes up and she doesn't know that oh, wow. the wall fell. Okay. But she's in such fragile health that th learning that the wall has actually fallen might actually kill her. So he kind of has to construct an illusion around her that East Germany is still a thing <laughs> in the 2000s. <laughs> wow. Okay, that you might have um, to put that on, on the list down the line, I think. That sounds really interesting. A comedy sounds a bit like, um, not, not in the same way, but Life is Beautiful. You know, this yeah. comedy taking place in a horrific situation. Uh, Roberto Benigni is fantastic in that film. Right. Um, go and watch this film. It's an amazing film. I'd never seen it before, and uh, it's up there with some of the best I've ever seen. So yeah. Yeah, it, I mean, it's. I'd probably put it in my top ten of my favorite films. Yeah, great film. Right, next week, um, because of the recent anniversary, fortieth anniversary, we are going to be watching uh, a true cult classic, and that is Walter Hill's The Warriors. Iconic lines, iconic costumes. And although people might now watch it and think, that could never happen, that's a bit weird, isn't it? It kind of was happening at the time. Until things changed a bit after it, it was kind of a, a microcosm of what was happening in inner cities at the time. Just, just more over and blown out of proportion a bit more. But one of my favourite films. And the soundtrack, oh, just great. <laughs> yeah, looking forward to it. Right, well, thank you so much for watching. This has been The Last Edit, our weekly film podcast. I have been Citizen Sleeve. This Matt has been... Silver Hawkins. And we will see you again next week. Take care. Take it easy.